Our next event is happening in Singapore between the 27th and 28th of February 2025. Now, Founders Longevity Forum Singapore is a unique event brought to you by Founders Forum, the Academy for Healthy Longevity at the National University of Singapore, and of course, Longevity Technology. Now, this event brings together global longevity leaders, clinicians, academics, investors, etc., to build really knowledge about the longevity sector and to drive growth across the region. Now, a company that you all know very well, MitoQ, is a New Zealand headquartered uh, supplements innovator, I'm delighted to say. And uh, Siobhan Mitchell, who's the Chief Science, Science and Technology Officer at MitoQ, is a key speaker at our event. And I'm delighted to say that she's joining us here today. So Siobhan, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Great. Well, obviously, lovely for you to join us and looking forward to seeing you in February. What will you be talking about when you join us at the conference? I will be talking about how MitoQ is trying to understand the longevity area better in terms of not only our proprietary patented molecule, mitoquinol mesylate, which has many different clinical and preclinical studies addressing various you know, aspects of aging and also longevity, but also how markets, you know, sort of consumers of different markets are thinking about longevity. So we think that it's very different in different places, right? So in China, it might be more about you know, I want to live long so I can stay independent, not be a burden on my children. In America, I think it's just more like, you know, how can I live to the sort of best life that I can and use all the sort of gadgets and technology? Well, other markets have, you know, other needs. So we're trying to learn how to address all those needs and to make sure that MitoQ has the answers for them. Yeah, well, that's fascinating. And of course, um, you're based in New Zealand, which is in that broader kind of uh, region, which is where we are going to be in terms of the Asia Pacific marketplace. And of course, it's growing fast. You mentioned China as well. So how is MitoQ leveraging you know, its geographic location and the markets in the Asia Pacific region? Yeah, well, we do have a very robust presence in China. So a lot of consumers know about us. They know about what we can do. But we have not done as much time understanding how other markets, so Singapore, I think is a really interesting market because it's recently been designated as a blue zone, right? So an area of longevity, and it's got some amazing universities like National University of Singapore and amazing aging researchers like Brian Kennedy and Barry Hallowell. So we're, we're thinking like, this is a place to really start to grow our Asia Pacific kind of understanding. And I would say that the next parts that we're going to go into will just be other countries like Thailand, like South Korea, where we know there's a lot more interest in aging, you know, preventing aging. And there's a lot more, I think, money involved that, you know, people can spend on taking advantage of, you know, what's out there in terms of supplements. I think that was less the case even like a few decades ago, but now there's a huge population that's interested in this. So we're, yeah, we're that's going to So yeah, so you're kind of you're thinking about the regional advantage, which of course is something why we're we're in Singapore because we can feel that the, yeah. the appetite for longevity is really happening there. And of course, uh, Andrea Meyer and her team they're very instrumental in the in the university there. And of course, her track is is very much about the geoscience. I, I say it's her track because I, I'm working on one and she's working on the other. But of course, what's really fascinating is this that you've got. I have so many peer-reviewed studies. I think over 600 peer-reviewed scientific papers are out there, 14 clinical trials. And I know having spoken with your colleagues in the past that you've got some really exciting things happening on the clinical, on the sort of disease side of how uh, your product can maybe affect um, outcomes in a more traditional healthcare environment. So I'd love to talk about that today with you. Yeah, I, I actually am very proud of that. And just to give you a sense of how much has been going on over the last year or so, we are now up to about 700 different studies on MitoQ and 25 published clinical trials, which I will point out, I think is more trials on a you know, putative anti-aging supplement than pretty much anything else out there, including things like you know, NR and PQQ. So we're really proud of that. And I will tell you these clinical studies all are addressing things that you should care about in aging. So many of them are in cardiovascular disease. So for instance, we have a study where um, there is an interest in showing whether people who are starting to show older, you know, kind of, I would say, issues like arterial um, stiffness, you know, what can they do early on before they start to actually show heart disease? Um, and so MitoQ was given for six weeks to these, these older people, like they're about 60 to 70. 
And it was shown that you could improve arterial flexibility um, to the sort of equivalent of 15 to 20 years reversal of their vascular aging. So wow. that was, I think, really impressive because I don't know if you know, arterial stiffness is one of those things that it's just a hallmark of aging. It happens to everyone yes. and there's not too much you can do about it. So we thought this was a really great result and, you know, kind of going into that area that we think is really important, which is prevention medicine. So yeah, you know, how do you take control of your own aging early on and do something about it? Um, so, John, another, I'd, ask you to, I'd love to talk about some of the other things that you're doing, but just sort of focusing on that for a minute. Um, what's the journey look like from there? So you, you've done the study. Um, you've got you've got some evidence to support that. How do you go to the next stage? Um, maybe deeper validation. Um, do you see that there is obviously the concept of you know, a grass supplement coming into a therapeutic environment? So do people get concerned about um, manufacturing processes or quality of ingredients and things like that? Um, sourcing. It's just fascinating to me because obviously the fact that you can do that. Um, with a product that people can buy online is brilliant. And I just understand, I want to know what the barriers to scalability might be or what the opportunities for scalability might be. I would say the opportunities for scalability are not so challenging when you have a molecule that many researchers are interested in. So, you know, as a follow-up to that study, yeah. there's now a much larger study. There's a study where they look particularly at postmenopausal women because you're probably aware that after menopause, women experience a lot more vascular issues, a lot more heart issues because of the loss of estrogen. What can you do about it? And in fact, they recently completed a study showing that with postmenopausal women, MitoQ could actually improve uh, vascular blood flow. And this is, I think, really important because at the same time, they were noticing that with exercise, that could actually not improve vascular blood flow as much anymore, you know, without the presence of estrogen. So MitoQ might be a really good answer for, you know, postmenopausal vascular and cardiovascular health. And I would say then, you know, the next step after that is going into areas like, you know, does MitoQ synergize with exercise? And in fact, it does. Uh, there is another study recently that showed that people with hypertension, when they're asked to exercise and also take MitoQ, there is a synergistic effect in terms of their blood pressure when they did exercise and also MitoQ at the same time. So I think that's that's also another really important one because for sure we know that exercise is one of the best things for longevity. And we also like to point out that, you know, there are things to make it work even better. And in my yep. is one of those. Yeah. So we have a lot yeah, of that that kind of interest. Mm -hmm. Well, I was gonna say obviously, so you're you're demonstrating that there are further clinical studies that are being done, which of course is compounding the evidence. Um, what, if I may ask, what, what, well, how do you flip the switch and kind of go, okay, right, guys, you've seen, you've seen the results. It's out there. You know, you can see now this has been in peer reviewed journals. How do you get this into a doctor's mentality and go, right, okay, actually, this is something that you can prescribe effectively for your, for your patients? Yeah, that is a challenge. I think there is that feeling from doctors of like, well, this is something new. You know, I actually need a lot of proof then. And I think the good news is we're building the extra proof. So, you know, I just told you about this arterial flexibility effect of MitoQ and this blood pressure effect. So now we're showing, you know, in many different studies, for instance, that we can improve things like vascular blood flow. So that's, I think, what doctors are looking for. It's like not just the one study, but the many studies all showing a great effect on cardiovascular health. We have seven different clinical studies showing effects on peripheral artery disease, on people with heart failure. So, you know, the gamut of, you know, just slight kinds of issues with your vascular health, the very early signs of aging, all the way down to serious diseases. So I think doctors wow. love that kind of stuff. Yeah. 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 Got it. And of course, we'll be talking about that at the conference. And are there any other disease areas that you're working on, Siobhan, that, you know, are kind of as progressed as where you are or maybe even earlier stage? Because I, 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 I suspect there are some Rembrandts in the attic. <laughs> Yeah, well, we have a great team. We have a team of many PhDs, for instance. And so we do have a lot of interests that we try to follow. I actually have a PhD in neuroscience. So I'm most excited about some of the diseases um, that we're trying with MitoQ. Like I would say cognitive frailty is one. In cognitive frailty, sometimes people don't really feel familiar with that term. It's basically before you get Alzheimer's. It's like when you're showing just the very slight cognitive issues, the very slight memory problems that might precede Alzheimer's, 
how do you take care of that? So we have a study going on right now that's looking at you know addressing those kind of memory problems really early on with MitoQ. We have studies um, in all sorts of, I think, areas that are really important for people these days. So chronic fatigue syndrome, we think there's a lot of burnout, there's a lot of fatigue. So we're looking at that as well too. We also have also, um, interestingly enough, but I would say, you know, the other area that people are really fascinated by right now is immune health. And we have um, several studies in immune health, including things like uh, preventing COVID and also preventing the effects of long COVID. So, so we're excited about those because, you know, you know that MitoQ is a mitochondrial antioxidant and there's more data coming out that mitochondria are actually very important for the immune system. They might actually be key linchpins for how the immune system responds to pathogens. So we're exploring that is a special area of interest for our team. Well, I mean, it sounds like a lot of work. And, you know, I, I know that, um, you know, this, this bridge across what you're doing in relation to the, the community that's clinical as well as the commercial community that's out there from the consumer side is uh, is a very interesting line that you, you as a company are walking, um, which is a great thing, right? So uh, just maybe just leaning into that, what would you say are the, uh, challenges facing the supplement space at the moment? Like what are the challenges, but also what are the opportunities at the moment as you see it? Because we'll be talking a lot about this at the conference. Yeah, and I love this question. I think it's so interesting. I mean, I've been doing aging research for 20 years. And even at the very beginning, it was a discussion of what is aging? You know, how do you measure aging? And, you know, we have a lot of biological aging tests and I think some of them are very good. Some of them are maybe not so good. Um, and also I think where... There's just a lot of confusion of just, you know, if you have a score on a biological aging test that shows that, you know, some sort of supplement or some intervention reversed your your age by five years, what does that really mean? You know, like, what is yep. that actually really telling you? So I think we need to understand that kind of thing better. There was a, a recent preprint, actually, um, from Yale showing that, you know, when they looked at epigenetic biological aging scores for, for things like rapamycin, which are really well known. Uh, to help with lifespan, there was no effect of rapamycin or things like exercise. So that was a little bit surprising. I think, you know, the longevity community is talking about that, like, what does that mean? But on the other hand, I think the exciting parts that, that we should focus on are the wearables, all the wearable technology. So, you know, there's been interest in, you know, CGMs, so continuous glucose monitors is a really great way to understand your aging because we know high levels of glucose, you know, kind of spikes of glucose can actually increase your aging rate. And, you know, there's watches now, Samsung's gonna bring out a watch next year that will help measure your glucose. So I think that's really cool. I recently heard about some, some earrings that you can wear that help measure, you know, your hormonal cycle. So I think these kinds of wearables will make people much more aware of how their, their health is being affected just in short term. And so then they can start to understand even long term, <clears throat> excuse me, how this yeah, is also the, affecting their health. Yeah, yeah. And I guess the interesting thing is just that if you've got a, if you're a commercial organization and you know who those customers are and they're prepared to share that information with you, even though it's not obviously in a controlled clinical type environment, you will be able to start to see some very interesting information at scale, right? Which is going to help you in terms of what you do, either in market positioning or product development in the future. Completely. And one of the ones we're most excited by is there's a new way to measure your mitochondrial health. It's called MeScreen. And it's just actually the first way that you can look at how well your mitochondria are making ATP, how well your mitochondria are dealing with oxidative stress. That's never been available before to the public, and now it is. So we're super excited by that because obviously MitoQ being a mitochondrial antioxidant, we think it'll have a great effect on that. So we're already hearing reports about the effects that my OQ is having. Well, great to hear. Well, Sean, obviously we look forward to seeing you at the end of February. I don't want to do the whole show right now because obviously <laughs> we want to keep, uh, keep up how to dry until the conference. But uh, thanks so much for joining us today. And I'm really looking forward to your session when we get to Founders Longevity Forum. Yeah, thank you. And I'm looking forward to it too.